and welcome to the Spectrum Show. Coming up, we get all the news and top selling games from December 1988. I play with a DKtronics keyboard. I review some games, have a chat to Jeff, and end with an update. But first, here's the news. A new organisation has been set up by John Dean and Mev Dink with the aim of supporting software authors. The Society of Software Authors will provide advice on a wide range of subjects, not limited to games programming. For an annual fee, new or experienced authors can ask about publishing rates, companies, contracts and legal things, as well as technical and programming advice. For existing authors who already have games published, the fee is £250 a year. For newer programmers, those that have not yet had any games released, it's a hundred. With the success of the recent film, it didn't take long for someone to grab the rights to produce a computer game based on The Running Man. Grand Slam announced that they were the lucky winners, and they will be producing games for a variety of micros ready for release in early 1989. It seems licenses are the big thing at the moment, and although not as big as The Running Man, the kids' TV show Postman Pat has been snapped up by alternative software and is to be turned into a game. This should be available just before Christmas. Codemasters, who produced a game for the charity Race Against Time, and who then had to change the cover for various reasons, are now saying that they regret the decision to actually get involved in the charity in the first place. The charity itself is said to be at least £2 million in debt, and the sales of the game are not as high as expected. This doesn't bode well, and Codemasters are uneasy about how things will end up. The amalgamation and buyouts continue, as Electronic Arts slowly expand its empire and get ever more bloated. It has recently bought up several software houses, including Martech and Accolade, and its latest acquisition is Dynamic. Dynamic are hoping that the deal will see better distribution of its games, such as Game Over and Army Moves, but we all really know how electronic art work. Is this the model for future gaming, I wonder? All smaller companies being swallowed up and dismantled to join a big, money-focused overlords. And that was the news, and now onto the top-selling games. At number 5 is Tracksuit Manager from Goliath. At number 4, Where Time Stood Still from Ocean. Number 3, Target Renegade from Imagine. At number 2, Road Blasters from US Gold. And at number 1, Football Manager 2 by Addictive. And that was the news and top selling games from December 1988. There were a surprising number of replacement keyboards for the Spectrum over its lifetime. Sinclair released the keyboard upgrade for the old rubber key models, allowing owners to get the improved Plus style keyboard. And of course, there were many third-party offerings. Fuller offered a few models, including the FDS and FD42. Nordic had a few, mainly from Fuller, as they bought out the company and sold their products. Saga had some really great ones, including the Emperor and Crusader. And I owned a Saga Emperor in the late 80s, and it was superb. There was the low-profile keyboard from ADS, another favourite of mine, and I had one of these as well. There were also models from Mancomp, Cheetah, Transform, Stonechip, and LMT. But probably the most famous was the DKtronics keyboard. Version 1 had no spacebar, Instead, the space key was placed close to the shift and enter keys, just like the original 48k Spectrum. Version 2, though, released around June 1984, introduced the spacebar. And for me, this was the classic DKtronics keyboard, and the one that I'd been looking for for quite some time. And at last a decent one came along, and I got my hands on it. On its arrival, the keyboard was in great shape. However, the Spectrum inside was not. I sent this off to Mutant Caterpillar for a full service and repair, and it wasn't long before I had it back and was ready to install it. Some keyboards had you bolting the lower half of the Spectrum underneath them, but the DKtronics one was a full replacement. 
you placed the Spectrum motherboard onto the base unit of the DKtronics keyboard and fixed it in place. There was also space for an Interface 1 if you wanted to, and there was even a special connector. I didn't use this though. Once screwed in, you connect the two ribbon cables for the keyboard, flip it over and fix it in place with some screws. Turn it over and you're ready to go. Brand new keyboards had blank keys and you had to place keyboard stickers on yourself. The unit is quite large, measuring 30.5cm by 24cm, with a sloping face going from 7cm at the back to 4cm at the front. This provided a nice typing angle. The keys are well made and feel really solid and make a great sound when in use. Around the back and you get access to all of the ports and you can see where the interface one would have fitted. There's also room inside the keyboard for a power supply but I opted to leave mine out. In use the unit feels really sturdy, the keys have decent travel and you get a really positive experience from it. The space bar is a great addition making typing so much easier and because the stickers have the full legends on them programming is simple. Obviously this keyboard was designed around typing for things like letters or word processing or even programming. However, when you use it with games, it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't make things any harder or any easier. The only downside to that, I suppose, is the noise of the keys versus the noise coming out of the Spectrum. Because remember, back in the day, all you had was the Spectrum speaker. In this modern era, we can connect things up to hi-fi systems or televisions and improve the sound of the Spectrum, so it doesn't really become an issue. I love this keyboard. It looks fantastic, it sounds fantastic, and it works really well. If you bought this at the right time, you also got a nice compilation from DKtronics. It included four games, Invaders, an early Space Invaders clone, Maziacs, the excellent maze exploring game, Jumbly, the block puzzle shifting game, and Zigzag, a 3D maze chase em up. If there's anything negative to say, I would have to say that the angle at the back can sometimes make it hard to push in interfaces. This came with a Nid Valley extender bar, so I could use that if I needed it, or the normal 56-way extender cable. Some users have modified their cases, adding a power switch or a reset button. Some even added lights. But I wanted a clean, untouched one, and I'm really glad I waited for the right one to come along. An excellent unit then, and it makes me just want to sit here and type. Thunderblade was released into the arcade by Sega in 1987 and was a hard 3D shooter seeing you control a helicopter armed with guns and missiles. The game had two views, a top-down view with parallax effects providing nice 3D depth and switching to a flight view as you pilot your helicopter across different terrains. A great looking game in the arcade and one that I played at a recent retro event and I was eager to see how the Spectrum could manage the 3D effects. Released in 1988 by US Gold, the game is, to my surprise, quite close to the arcade. You'll never get the same graphics as the arcade, but the developers have done a pretty good job here. The game is tough, avoiding the buildings and the shots coming up from the tanks below. You just have to shoot anything that moves and keep dodging. In fact, just shoot anything all the time. Your cannons are best suited to ground based enemies and missiles should be used for airborne targets, although in the frenzy of battle you just tend to fire anything. The graphics use the same layered parallax effect to give the illusion of height and it works quite well on the spectrum. When or if you reach the end of the first level you change viewpoints and this is where the actual game mechanics create a problem. Because your helicopter is large and close to you, it can block out enemy targets, 
and this was also the case in the arcade version too. The controller is a mixed bag. You can use a joystick with or without the keyboard speed control. Not using the keyboard is terrible and you have to hold the fire and move the joystick to get some speed, meaning you can't shoot anything, and also you slow down if you accidentally press fire and down together. Using the keyboard as a speed control is easier and makes more sense, but it doesn't make the game any easier. Sound is a mix of helicopter blades and white noise representing explosions. It's effective, but could have done with a bit more variation, I think. To get to see the other levels, including the end of level boss, I had to use the RZX playback, because I'm just not good enough to get there. It's a good arcade conversion, and one that surprised me but with a difficulty level that high, it can border on frustration sometimes. You can't see things to dodge as the screen is just a blur of pixels. Having just played the arcade version, it does give the same feeling of movement, and anyone who bought it back in the day I think would have been satisfied, that is, if they were good at the original game in the first place. A good action shooter then, a tad too difficult, but certainly worth playing. games on the spectrum numbered probably less than 10, and good ones even lower. A few spring to mind such as Codemasters Pinball Simulator and Sagittarian's Pinball Wizard, but this one may be known to more players. Initially released by ERE of France, and later re-released by PSS in 1985, this is Macadam Bumper, and it has a neat trick up its sleeve that we'll get onto shortly. The game follows the usual pinball fare, with various bumpers, flippers, bonuses and targets. The table does though have a lot of flippers, seven in total, and this can become confusing as the ball flies about. To release the ball you press and hold both left and right flipper keys, and the plunger slowly lowers down. Releasing the keys will send the ball into play. From this point on, the Spectrum sometimes struggles with realistic movement, and I think we can forgive it that little bit. After all, it's only an 8-bit machine. The ball sometimes slows down on its own, but this is no different to other such games on the Sinclair machine. The bumpers work well, and the flippers do a fairly good job of mimicking the real thing. The table is squeezed into the right hand side of the screen, with the left being taken up by a semi clad woman, over which are the scores and number of balls and bonuses etc. Once the game gets underway, the sound is used really well for a 48k game, with different sound effects for different elements of the table. Various bonuses pop up from time to time, and once you get past the multiple flipper issue, the game is really enjoyable. Early games were over fairly quickly, but as time went on, the five balls that you get lasted quite a long time. Now, if you get fed up with the single table, here is where the game scores extra points. You can design your own. Pressing C from the main menu will take you onto the table editor, and starting with a blank table, you can place all the different elements where you like, and then play it. If it's not to your liking, you can go back and modify it, or start again with a clean sheet. Making your own table is a bit tricky at first, until you get used to where all the elements are drawn from. But with a bit of perseverance, you can soon have a playable table, even if it does look rubbish. At first, I couldn't find any way to add colour to my newly created table, so it was all just yellow. But, after reading the inlay, I found the instructions and you can actually paint attributes over various items. 
Once I'd found this, I could make the most terrible coloured tables in the history of pinball. You also have a chance to draw your own shapes too, so if you have enough time, you could create some nice looking tables and exchange them with your friends. There's also a modification screen, and this allows you to adjust everything from scoring, tilt, slope of the table, the force of the bumpers, triangles, holes, and everything else. And all this allows you to build a table just for you. It also allows you to change the ball speed from its default 80. Slowing things down does help when you're learning new tables, but I think it's better to keep it running at 80 to get a better overall experience. Overall then, a nice game, and the table editor is really a great addition. The sheer amount of modifications you can do is fantastic, giving the game a lot of extra life. I wonder if there were any table packs ever released for this, or maybe that's an idea for a competition, who knows. Anyway, this is a highly recommended pinball game, even if you don't like making your own tables. This is Rover, or Remote Operated Vehicle Recovery. Released in 2018 by myself, the idea is that you're controlling a remotely operated, uh, vehicle, and in the sands of Egypt you discover a tomb. Lowering the unit down, you set up a drop point and then go in search of treasure. The unit has a large drill on the front, and this is needed to break boulders blocking certain entrances. Using the drill, and generally moving about, uses up power, but this can be replenished back at the drop point. The unit can also only carry one item at a time, and this has to be taken back to the drop point as well. The tomb is infested with various things that take away power if you collide with them, so you have to be careful when you're moving around the sometimes ruined corridors and rooms. The game is yellow, and this was done on purpose. You're inside a tomb in Egypt, surrounded by sand, and sand is yellow. And also the idea was that you are a controller and were operating it from a small screen on the surface. There's a nice tune on the intro page and various effects throughout. It's a maze collect map that should keep you busy for a few minutes if you like this style of game. I can't recommend it, because it's my game and I've been called about this before. So, judging on what you can see, I'll leave that one up to you. Okay, computer history. Does it include consoles? Anything, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, if, well, if we're including, including consoles, then it's going to have to be a Binatone, isn't it? One of those Binatone TV games that I started with that, that just had 17 versions of Pong on it. Me too. I had exactly the same thing. With an anal mine had an analog joystick. I think mine had just a, a little um, dial that you turn left or right. Mine had an analog joystick and only about four or five games on. It had, it had it had the usual versions of pong, pong and tennis and football, which were just and hockey in hockey, yeah, <laughs> which were just different kind of slightly different configurations and numbers of bats, weren't they? <laughs> and unfortunately, it, it doesn't work anymore because I took it to Brits to try and find out how it worked. Ah, oh, nice. <laughs> well, I think that that got about three months worth of play, and then um, nothing for a couple of years until um, the ZX eighty one came out. You had a ZX eighty one. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't. Grabbed, grabbed that. And then after that, I got a Spectrum. Mine, mine was the Spectrum. Got... What, your first computer yeah. was a Spectrum? Yeah, it was the Spectrum. Right. I didn't know I was getting it. it. I just got it for Christmas, and it was the best thing I've ever had. After that, well, I had a break from Spectrums, and I got a Commodore 64, 
and had it for about three months, two months, three months. It was mainly about the music. I was in a software shop looking to buy Spectrum games, yep. and they had Ghostbusters on the 64, and the music was stunning to me, at that, having owned a Spectrum. So I persuaded my parents to buy me a 64, and then I went out and bought as many Rob Hubbard games as I could find. <laughs> So after my Spectrum, there was nothing. It was a big hiatus for me. There was nothing. Right. Probably because I went to university and I couldn't afford a, a computer. Because um, yeah. it was a big step up to things like the Amiga and the ST. Um, it was a massive step because of the price. They were about 500 The Amiga was 499 I think. Mm. Um, the, when, the, when the first came out, the Amiga 500s. And I, I badgered and badgered my father to buy me one. And he, he kept saying no. And then eventually we sort of went out and bought one. That was that's the second best machine I've ever owned. The Amiga, it's obviously, the Spectrum's first, but the Amiga is a close second. Yeah. The, and then I got a job in a in a computer shop selling um, Amigas, so I had access to all the games. Cool. Well, I, I was kind of twofold. The next the next thing I got that was dedicated to games really was a Nintendo sixty four. So it was a big oh, jump. Right, yeah, that was yeah. a huge jump from the Spectrum, obviously. But I really got into PC games. I was late. Well, I wasn't late into PC games. I I went through. Numerous versions of Amigas. I had a 500, I had a 500 plus, 600, 1500, 2000, and then a 4000. And then the guy that owned the computer shop, I think, said, um, what do you want for a Christmas bonus? Do you want 100 quid or do you want uh, an Amstrad 286 PC with a monitor? And I said, I'll have that. I'll, I'll take that computer. And that sort of kick-started an, another phase of my life, really. So I'd gone through Spectrums, I'd gone through um, Amigas, and at that point, the Amiga market was was dropping off. Yeah. And the you know the, the the general feel was things were going over to the PC. So I started on the PC with the two eight six and yeah. then went just, just carried on. Well, I think the first PC I had was a Pentium, so it was a lot later than you. <laughs> yeah, right. And I was playing things like Doom. Um, Doom yeah. was great. We used to in the in the lab that I worked with in when I was doing my um, PhD. We used to play Network Doom. Um, right. <laughs> and, until the network administrator complained that we were flooding the network with lots of Doom packets. Um, yes. yeah. Well, you've jumped way ahead of me then because when when I I was really lucky because I worked in a computer shop. So if we got anything back or if we got anything that was damaged and I, and it was half working or part working, I, I had free reign to you know budget up and get parts from somewhere else. So I, I had two eight six, then I went a three eight six. Then a four eight six, and then various four eight sixes, and then the then the early early Pentiums. So I just worked my way up slowly as they as things came into the shop and the prices came down. I, I was buying them at retail, so I could get them at retail. So it was it, I was very oh, lucky cool, in that, yeah, in that yeah. respect. But the Nintendo sixty four was interesting because it kind of links back to the Spectrum because of course Rare was a huge big developer for it, and the world. yeah yeah. So I bought it because of Goldeneye. I bought it for because I saw Goldeneye and wanted to play it. Then what after that? I think mean, I think the next thing and probably one of the things that I think is truly retro was uh, Game Boy Advance. I got a Game Boy Advance and that was brilliant, especially the SP. Uh, handheld wise, I I was really wanted to buy Lynx because we had a couple in the shops mm. and they they were really really good machines. But I, I ended up buying a, a Game Gear uh, and again it, that was very short lived. I think I had it for about four months and then i sold it on and actually it was it was kind of around the game boy advance time that you you started getting things like the gp2x and the gp32 that you could you could actually emulate on a handheld some of the some of the old stuff spectrum things i think that, and yeah i think what did I, I had a playstation 2 after that but we're getting a, we're getting a bit too modern now aren't we so. yeah yeah i, I had got the original xbox way way after its lifetime just so i could put all the emulate, emulators on it yeah I've got an Xbox One, so I've got the Ultimate Rare Rare Replay with all the Ultimate games on. So all back full circle, though, the Spectrum Next is going to be my next computer. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, it, hopefully, it be it will be has been is my next computer. <laughs> yeah. And the same with me. Whatever you said. <laughs> <laughs> I think that ends the section, Paul. That, that ends it. That's the one. <laughs> This is Styx, released by Bugbyte Software in 1983. And if you didn't know, it was written by Matthew Smith before he went on to write Manic Manor and Jet Set Willy. You have to get across the River Styx and kill the Grim Reaper. And this involves navigating a maze full of spiders, 
and then diving into a river and shooting fish, and finally another maze before you can kill the reaper himself. The first maze has a large spider that keeps spawning smaller ones, so to continue you have to kill this first. The fish level is fairly easy, you just have to make sure that you don't hit the spawning things as you exit. The bottom maze has more spiders and the reaper himself. Yes, it's a simple game. All the action is on one screen. And with a bit of care you should be able to kill the reaper in your first few attempts. Although I spectacularly managed not to do this when I was recording. If you do kill the reaper, you go back to the start and try again. If you use your laser too much, it shrinks, so you have to get closer to the spiders and fish to kill them, so you need to pick your shots carefully. The graphics are simple but move smoothly, and the sound is just a set of basic machine code zaps. It's nothing special, but it's quite fun to play, waning at just 5k. Have a go on this if you want to see where Matthew started, or just have a fun game to play for a few minutes. Most of my games, including Rover, were authored by the excellent Arcade Games Designer, or AGD. Even though it's capable of some fantastic things, it does have a few shortfalls, but this is where AGDX comes in. AGDX is a modified version produced by Alan Turvey and Dave Sapphire, and has an impressive 50 plus editions. There are far too many to go through individually, but you can see them listed on the screen here. Some nice features include the ability to flip a sprite vertically, and also to get a preview whilst editing, and you can also nudge sprites left and right, up and down, to get them into the right position. Each sprite is also displayed with its place in memory, and this is a common addition throughout other areas too, and helps with further external modifications that Alan works on. The blocks section gets a makeover too, with nudge, flip and rotate options, as well as providing 255 block types to use. You can paste a sprite into four blocks if you want, and in the screen editor you can use the Z key to place an empty block, and that saves all that jumping backwards and forwards trying to find block zero. The fonts get some neat touches too, like highlighting the character that's been edited and letting you copy fonts to blocks. Sprites can be placed on screen to a pixel level now, with their coordinates displayed, and there's also a new control template for Pac-Man style games. Lastly, there are a few additional commands to use, and shorter syntax for existing ones. Overall, this is a great version of an already brilliant tool. <laughs>